Okay, my full name is Ernest Light. I grew up in Czechoslovakia in a very democratic country until 1939. In 1939, I was taken over by Hungary. The rest of it is after that, my life in Hungary. In you know, Czechoslovakia, I have only very, very pleasant memories, my youth, and then in 1939, and the Hungarian came in, things have ch changed a lot. And I was working for a while in lumber business. And then in 1941, I was inducted to the Hungarian army. And I thought I'm going into the army. And I arrived at the assigned place where I was going. I came there and I found out we are not in the army. We were going through so-called a certain military training, but without guns or anything. And after the eight weeks, six, either six or eight weeks, we were sent out to different camps. We became so-called, in Hungarian, Munkatab or labor camp, and we were all sent to different labor camps. And then in 1942, I was sent in the summer, no, late summer already, no, actually summer, to a place called Lutosa. That was again in the mountains. There was a place where the Hungarian ski troops used to train for the winter. And I spent there from May until about September. Then we were removed again and then went again to another other place. We were moving always on the move. Uh, Hungarian labor camps, were more or less really labor camps where you were working but you were never starving. Maybe you didn't have the things you would like to eat or any other things, but there was a certain amount of freedom. Once a year you even got a furlough to go home for a few days and you could go out. If you were in a city, if you had money, you could supplement your food or anything of those. In 1943, we were told, got a furlough, and we were told to go home to take some extra clothing because we were going somewhere. By when I entered the Hungarian labor camp, we were wearing Hungarian military uniforms. And then by 1942, the uniforms were removed and they were, we were back in civilian clothes. So we went home, we came back, and we wound up in a city in Hungary called Seged. And there they told us to prepare ourselves the following day or two days later, we were going somewhere else. We went out to the Danube River after that. And we went for a ride on the Danube, and we arrived to Yugoslavia. And in Yugoslavia, they we went to a place called Bor, B-O-R, and they had a copper mines. And these were the largest copper mines in Hungary. And most of us were working in the copper mines. And some of us working on canalization. I wound up among those. We were in the barracks. We were under the Hungarian supervision. But when we went out to work, we worked for the German so-called labor units. It's called TOD, T -O -D, and the jobs varied. And again, I wound up we, where I was working. It was, we were usually, I uh, had machines there, cement, we were preparing cement for the buildings, anywhere where there were needs needed. They needed asphalt or anything like that. These are the things we were used to prepare. Uh, the things were actually bearable. I used to work even night shift, and I remember that I grew up in a small town, more or less on a, where agriculture was the livelihood for the people, and I never liked tomatoes. But when I was there, I remember the field was there, 
at nighttime, I used to go out in the field and take some tomatoes and they tasted very good. So then I knew every night I used to go there and get some more tomatoes. In 1944, in January, we had a very mild winter in Yugoslavia. We were removing a retaining wall. And as we were removing the retaining wall, the wall let go and quite a few of us were injured and I was one of those. I had a broken arm, a broken leg and other lacerations. We didn't send us to the hospital. They had an infirmary there and they had there some people who were the so-called medics and we were lying there around for a while and then they accumulate a group of us and they send us back to Hungary. We were not able to walk, actually we were carried into the trains and we arrived back to Hungary to the same place where, from where we left, to the same place of Seged. Wound up at the hospital, we arrived at late, I mean, in late afternoon. As we arrived there, they took us to a military hospital and they, we got a big welcome and because they thought that we are coming from the Russian front, our injuries were inflicted there. But after that they found out who we are, that we are actually not from the Russian front, but we are from labor camp from Yugoslavia. The following day they took us a lot, but we remained in the same hospital and we were put in a separate ward. And there were us about 18 or 20 of us and we had actually, they did us a favor because we were separated in so-called Jewish community in Saget. A lot of those younger ones came to visit us, brought us all kinds of food and all, all, every, a lot of things. The irony of it is that in 1944, in January, February, I had still got visitors from my home a brother of mine, a nephew, and a brother-in-law came to visit me to the hospital. In Hungary, actually, you were still free to travel, no yellow badges or anything like that. Little by little, I started to recuperate, feeling better, and I was praying and hoping that I could, I wish I could stay there longer. I was not too anxious to go back there from where I came. Then, suddenly in March, towards middle of March, it was about 16th or 17th, something, March, they came in and they told us that we had been discharged and we were sent back to the place where we were inducted and that was called a place in Hungary in Kosho and in Czech it was Kosice. And as we arrived there and they told us that you're very lucky people because Hungary just passed a law. According to that new law, anybody who was overseas or out of the country and suffered any kind of injuries automatically is being discharged. On March 18th, I got my discharge papers. Of course, I stayed in the, in the place where we were, in the so-called headquarters of there. Uh, that hospital, it was not a hospital, that was the quarters of, the, of our regiment. And the morning I got up on the 19th of March, I walked out on the street to, and went over to some people that I knew and for breakfast. And as I came out from breakfast and I saw an army marching in. And I was familiar with the army because I was a Yugoslavia, and Yugoslavia was occupied by the Germans. I had no idea what to expect or where or when, what changes that, that will bring. But anyhow, uh, after that, I made an arrangement somehow and I got on a train a little bit and I got back to my place of my birth. And I came home and as I came home, I at home I had a father a mother, a, one brother, and one sister, and a small child. As I came home and 
my father and mother, they were elderly people already, and they were in the 60s. My father was in the 70s and mother in the late 60s. And I had a brother who, as a child, was had polio, and he was partially paralyzed by his left side. And then I had my sister, whose husband was in the labor camp, Hungarian labor camp on the Russian front, and the small little girl. And we, nobody was aware that really what to expect or what might happen or anything. At least I wasn't. I was not exposed to any kind of newspapers or radio. I really had no idea what to expect or what's going on. But by the second day already, orders came out to sew on a yellow band. You have to start wearing it. Curfews, little by little, every day some new regulations. But it didn't take too long. By <clears throat> April, Iran, the Jewish holiday of Passover, that was the last holiday that I spent with my family. And as I pointed out, Hungarian labor camps were a little bit different than what I encountered later. My brother, who was in a Hungarian labor camp, even came home for the first few days of the holiday. And we were conducting so-called uh, our, our service on the evening, and that is so-called the seder. And we were sitting and reading the Haggadah, and suddenly a German soldier walked in with a gun on his shoulder, and we were not, didn't know what to expect or what will happen or anything. The thing was that across the street from us was a living family, and they had a daughter, she was a pretty girl, and the German soldier tried to abduct her, she ran away, and they came to look her, to her, for her in our house. And we were very relaxed, they were talking at all, and he stood there for a while, and turned around and walked out. I think, I always wonder what made them walk out, why he did that, and he didn't even look for anything. I thought maybe he somehow saw a family sitting there, praying together and anything, so he didn't think of it, anything that could be something, if they, would be, they were nervous or anything, or I have no answer to it, that is the truth. And right after the holidays, unless they were eight days of holiday, orders came to get ready, pack up your belongings, the maximum was 50 kilo per family. They took us to the local synagogue, and it's a small Jewish community. There were only about 16 Jewish to 18 Jewish families, and we wound up in the synagogue, and from there we were put on a train, went for a short ride, and wound up in the city Ushorot, or in Hungarian it's called Ungvar. And we came there, and they took us to a place. We came there, it was an abandoned brick factory, and as we arrived there, there were some people there, but fortunately, as we arrived there, it was nighttime, and it was a very mild weather in April, and we slept the first night outside, and by the morning, they organized more things, and they settled us, squeezed us in, old people, young people, women, children, everything together. There hardly was any room to lie down, but anyhow, and they set up kitchens there. The things daily got more difficult because every day new and new transport were coming. And uh, the thing was, it was the difficult part was that there were a lot of children, women. Women were not taken to any kind of camps, labor camps. And in old, as I said, older people, and only very few of my age, because most of those people my age, up to 40, 42, were all Hungarian men. All men were in Hungarian labor camps. And we stayed there, and of course, all kinds of rumors started to circulate. Uh, this, uh, we are going there. The one of them was that 
they're taking us to Germany, especially to assist with the German economy. They'll take us to some farms where most of the German men are on the front. We'll be help as helpers to help to keep the farms going. We arrived there, it was, I think, the 17th or something. By May 25th, 24th, suddenly our orders came to pack up. There was not much to pack. pack. We wound up in a open field and said, you wait here and you will be transported from here somewhere else. We were standing there and waiting for the train. The Hungarians still looked through all our belongings and anything, whether you have anything worthwhile, they took away from us. I only remember I had a very nice leather coat and one Hungarian soldier told me, give me this coat. And I says, I cannot give it to you because I might need it where I'm going. And he told me, don't worry, where you are going, you will not need the coat. And that was my first somehow signal there is something wrong. I just had no idea what to expect, but I started to think, what does that mean? Anyhow, we suddenly we saw a big, a long train came on, but not a train actually, it was cattle cars, and all of us had to go down. Those who couldn't walk up, they were carried up, and we were squeezed in. I don't know, about 90 or something to a cattle car, no facilities, no, take, not, no water, and we started to travel. We were lucky in one respect. As we were traveling, we traveled all night, and the next day we arrived, so we were not in cattle cars for too long. We arrived to our destination, and I had no idea where we were. The only thing I remember, they opened up the cars, and we came out, as we came out, I saw soldiers, German soldiers with dogs, and screaming, rouse, rouse, schnell, schnell, out, out, fast, fast. And we tried to get out, and everybody started to look for families. Chaos, screaming, children crying, older people flying, uh, lying down because they couldn't walk. It was just real chaos. It's very difficult. I don't have the words to describe what it was and what was going on. After a while, started the so-called division, male on one side, female on the other side, and then came the so-called selection. Among, I am only familiar with what happened this among the male. Of course, it happened the identical thing among females too. All young people able-bodied people were sent on one side, all older people, children, were sent on the other side, and just we had to go follow the orders. Of course, we saw another thing there. There were the so-called Sonderkommandos, people who spoke Polish, Yiddish, any of these languages, and they were all striped uniforms. And of course, you couldn't communicate with them. There was all just everybody was rushing, everybody was war, didn't know where to turn, who to ask and what to ask. Anyhow, those of us who were selected, so-called able-bodied people, we went for a walk and came into a big, big building as we arrived there. And they told us to take off your clothes and to put your clothes neatly together and to remember where you left your clothes. We'll we are going to the showers now, and as we come out, so you'll be able to find your clothes. Of course, we followed the orders, but before that, they went and they cut our hair. They gave us a physical examination. What I mean is, looked in your mouth, and you had to bend down and see whether you don't have any valuable things on you. And went into the showers came out of the showers, we were ready to go for our clothes, and here they threw at us the so-called striped uniforms. Of course, they didn't ask you what size you wear, so we had to exchange each with the other, 
the smaller ones and the bigger ones. So anyhow, we got our uniforms and then started to march for a while. We were marching together and came to barracks. Once we got into those barracks, there were already three tier beds there and there were some people already there. Exhausted, tired. I didn't even care of anything as long as I have a place to put down my head and went to bed. And I still didn't know where I was. In the morning when I got up, I was told I am in Auschwitz. And then on June 6th, suddenly came an announcement that Allied forces tried to land in course. We repelled them and inflicted heavy casualties. That was V-Day. It was the Normandy landing. And unfortunately, they were right. They inflicted heavy casualties. But I told myself, this is all propaganda. And I came back in the evening to the barracks. And I even told my friends not to worry. The war will be over soon. Unfortunately, it didn't. Towards end of July already, you could hear the artillery, the Russians were coming closer and closer to Warsaw. And on the 28th or so of July, they came into our barracks and they announced everybody, we are leaving tomorrow. Anybody who is, doesn't feel well, has difficulties to walk, doesn't have to leave. Let them stay there, and we'll after that transport them there where you are going. As we got up in the morning, it was a Sunday morning, and they gave us some sardines or something like that. And it was July 29, hot. We started to walk. By noontime, we were most exhausted, especially thirst, which was almost unbearable. Finally, we arrived to a river. There were cows, horses, but there was a bridge, and the SS got on the bridge and set up their guns, and we lay, they led us into the water. The water was warm, but it was still wet, and that was all right, too. We stayed there for a few minutes, and suddenly orders came, rouse, rouse, schnell, schnell, again, out, out, fast. And those people who were still in good shape, we went out, and we came out. Some didn't make it fast enough, and suddenly you looked up, and the river turned red. There were all blood there and everything. We kept on walking, wound up in the evening in a place, an open field again. Only tools we had is a spoon and a mesh kit. And as we were there, we decided we'll dig. Maybe we'll find something. Started to dig, I don't know how. The water level must have been very high there and suddenly if there was water, of course it was murky, you couldn't drink it or anything, we went to sleep, but the morning we woke up, the water cleared up and we could drink. And so we went on the next day, for the next walk, we were walking for a day, I think about three days, that was from Warsaw to Kutno, that was over 80 kilometers, and we arrived to Kutno, they put us in a train, uh, what's the name, in a, side of the train there and we were sitting there and suddenly it started to rain and kept on raining and raining. While we were walking it was always hot. We stayed there for a few days and got wet, no change of clothes or anything and then suddenly started to clear up and it cleared up. Only thing we got is lice all over us. Finally the train arrived they put us in back to kettle cars, and as they put us there, again, squeezed in, and it got hot. At least when you were out and you were walking, you could breathe. Here was almost impossible. People, the second day, relieved themselves to get some wetness, something to do. Some of them just couldn't take it when Berserk started to scream, cry, everything possible. And that was one of the most difficult trips that I encountered because nothing worse than thirst. Anyhow, finally we arrived to a destination again. 
Gadat. Gadat, the only thing I did, the first thing, I touched the ground just to feel some dampness to put it to my lips. We came in, we got into the barracks, and they told us to undress. We undressed, they disaffected us, took showers, cleaned up, got clean uniforms, and we were in Dachau. I stayed in Dachau a few days, little by little, they recouped a little bit, and suddenly the orders came, we are leaving again. And the interesting part of it is, otherwise, I don't know what, but that they didn't have cattle cars, they put us on a regular train, we went for a short distance, and we arrived to a place called Mühldorf, and Mühldorf was the place where they have an underground building, underground airplane factory, and a lot of us wound up in the factories, other wound up in other, I didn't go to the factory, again I wound up working in a warehouse and all kinds of places. Routine was the same, the food the same, everything like in Auschwitz, only difference was there were no selections. By January, February, a lot of us were, became sick with typhus, I was one of those two, and there's a period, I don't know how long it took, what, I have no memory of it at all. The only thing is I remember, one day I woke up and I felt better. And then I went back to work by March already. We could see and hear the American planes fly freely. By April, we're getting more already. You could see that there was not no resistance at all. Finally, we thought now we'll be liberated. But they still didn't do that. They put us on trains again and we started to travel. As we traveled, they were, couldn't travel too far because you always had to go to try another route because they were occupied already by the Allied, a lot of places, Allied forces. Anyhow, we wound up on a railroad junction as we came in there and we were sitting in our cattle car suddenly, whether the, the British or the American Air Force, I don't know who, machine guns us. Whether they were aware of who was there or not, I have no idea, but suddenly we break through as we broke through, they saw our uniforms, the shooting stopped, and we walked out. We started to look for some food. There was a small village close by. We went in and looked for it. I remember I went into a sty, a pig sty, and there I got some potatoes. And then suddenly the so-called Hitler Jugend, Hitler Youth, surrounded us rounded us up and took us back to the train. We came back to the train, some of us were dead, injured, and we were traveling the following day again. By noontime or afternoon it was, I don't remember, it's a long time ago. I remember that we got out, and it was quiet, no sign of anything, no sign of soldiers, no sign of Germans. We decided we'll start walking. We kept on walking, as we were walking, suddenly we saw a group, smaller groups we were like that. Suddenly we saw a farmhouse. We went into the farmhouse. They saw us. They gave us food. I don't know whether they were afraid or just wanted to get rid of us or they felt sorry for us. I have no idea. And I wish they wouldn't have given us food because in cases like that when you're starved, you have eaten for days. The worst thing you can do to a person is to give them food. Anyhow, it would have been almost impossible to resist not to take the food because your eyes were popping up when they saw the food. Finally, we wound up in abandoned military barracks. As we came there, we were exhausted and by the evening bloated, stomachs bloated, diarrhea, everything possible. That people all over again and we stayed there and the following day we heard a lot of shooting going on and I said to myself, gee, after all these things I thought I'm free here, the Germans are coming back. In the morning we got up and there were 
<coughs> nuns, nurses, medics, and we found out the shooting for the celebration of V-Day, the victory, and it was the end of the war. And this is my story from, of liberation. I thought to myself, I'm going back to the same Czechoslovakia that I lived until 1939 there, 38, actually 39. And I, I came b back to the place where I was born. As I came back, I remember I came to so-called the city that's Chop. Chop was the center for that. It was an eastern part of Czechoslovakia. From there, trains went, went to Russia, to all the parts of the, uh, Europe. And there were a lot of trains coming with survivors. And I remember there were some of them going east to Poland. And there was a soldier who was Jewish. And the girls, they were mostly girls. And they asked them, tell me, when we get back, and they came from farmland, allowed them to, will we get our land back, our homes back? You will get everything back. So the only thing I would uh, advise you, you see, instead of going east, turn around and take another train and go west. That was a lesson to me of the so-called, the, the, the wonderful part of, the, of communism. And I came back to my home, I arrived, and I found out I'm not, neither in Czechoslovakia, nor in Hungary. The eastern part of Czechoslovakia became Russia. I stayed there a few days, and I found out that my brother, who during the Passover holiday came home for a visit, I mean a furlough, he survived. He was liberated in the Hungarian labor camp in October 1944. The difference, there were six months in Hungary if there would have been, we wouldn't have been deported when we were six months later, the Russians were there already. Then I had another brother who was on the Russian front as a Hungarian labor camp, and he was captured by the Russians, by the Hungarians. He wound up in labor camp, then I mean in a prison camp in uh, Russia. And during that period in 1943, the Czechs were organizing a so-called a Czech legion. He joined the legion and he came back as a liberator back to Czechoslovakia. And I s stayed at my place of where I re when I returned and I thought to myself, this is not the place for me. I saw what's going on, chaos. I want to get out from here and arranged after that to leave that part, and went back to Prague. My brother had an apartment there, and I settled in Prague. I'm trying to make it short because it's too boring, probably. And I came, I came to Prague, and I stayed in Prague for a few days, and uh, met a lot of people who returnees, and I had my nephews, uh, nieces, a couple of them, and we were together. But I have to return yet back to my place. When I returned to my home, the people there were quite kind and quite nice. They were not, they were Greek Catholics. These people, at least I did not encounter the things what the, unfortunately the Jews of Poland encountered, that awful hatred for the Jews. These people were very kind and tried to be helpful. I remember before we deported, my, my brother, who was certainly disabled, but he was very bright, and he made up a list, and we gave to some neighbors some of our belongings. And he hid it in a place, and I knew where it was. And when I came back, I took out that paper, and I went to these people, and these people returned, most of the people returned everything the way they were given to. And unfortunately, since I was leaving, I had to take it somewhere else. I took the stuff to a place, a city that was Czechoslovakia, a small town, because I had some people that I knew there. And I went to Prague, as I went to Prague, 
And by the time I came back for my things, that part was occupied by Russia too already. All the things that I saved was left there. I never got anything out of these things. But anyway, it was a wonderful gesture of those people. And, and while I was in Prague, the third period, period, the Czechs decided to avoid the problems of 1930s, and they tried, they will like, deport all the Germans from Sudetenland back to Germany, and they were looking for people to come to the Sudetenland and to take over some of the farms or some of the mills or anything there to go to work. I wound up, all three of us wound up in the Sudetenland in a place called close to Ellenbogen, Loket, and then I wound up in a place, Sechi. They had a, a, what's the name, a mill where they were, uh, no, lumber mill. And I worked there because I was a familiar with lumber business. And there I stayed. And while we were there, we wrote to our, we had a sister here in the city of Pittsburgh. And I had, I didn't remember, we didn't, none of, either of us remember the address, but we knew this Pittsburgh PA, and they got our letter, and they cast in contact with us, and they started to look, send us papers to come to the United States. But I had problems. I was, again, military age. I went through my physical, and I was inducted to the Czech Army to go, to go in in October. Suddenly, I don't know how, I had a passport and I left Czechoslovakia in August and came to Paris and from Paris to the United States. After that, on Labor Day and the beginning of September 1946, and I've been living here since then. I look old. <laughs> That's the truth. I'll be 88. <laughs>